excited today, not because I have anything for you, but I really do believe the Lord has something for you this morning. I was uh, reading and, and praying and journaling uh, last Thursday, and, and those guys, Jeremy and Mick, and those that know me well, know that I love my time in the mornings with Abba and the Lord and the Holy Spirit, and we just have an amazing time together, and I was, I was journaling uh, last Thursday, and, and, I, and, I, and I have a word, and I want to share that with you today, and, um, and, and it comes out of a passage of Scripture that we'll get to in just a moment, but as I was reading this passage of Scripture, uh, there was a question that came to my mind when, I, when the Lord showed me really what, what the truth of this passage is. It's a question I want to ask you as we begin this morning, and that is this. What does God desire the most from you? One word, if you could boil it down to one word, what does God desire the most from you? What does he desire the most from me? And I think that's a question that's an important question for us to ask and to consider. Um, I mean, we want to know what our Heavenly Father wants of us. We, if, 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 if you could say, God, what do you desire the most from me? And God gave you an answer, you would, you would strive in all of your life to fulfill that. And so it's a question that I've asked several groups over the past um, several days since the Lord kind of downloaded this to me. And it's been interesting, the answers that I get. Um, in one group that I was in, I asked the question, there were 12 or 13 people in that small group. And, and here are the answers as I go around the room, obedience, loyalty, love, perfection. What does God desire the most? And, and as I think about it, um, and as I've thought about it, and as I saw in this passage of scripture when the Lord showed it to me is, I think we can boil it all down to one thing. And I think we're blessed to have walked through the journey. And I think if I were to ask many of you, uh, I hope that the answer would be intimacy. I hope it would be an abiding relationship um, with him, because I think that's what he, well, that's what, I think that's what the father desires the most. I mean, let's think about our relationship. For those of you who have kids, think about your relationship with your kids. Do you want your kids to just be obedient and not have a relationship with you? You want them to do everything perfectly, but you, you, they don't express love to you. And, and all of us would answer no, you know, we want the relationship and out of that relationship to come obedience, to come loyalty, to come faithfulness, all of those things. And so when I think about that, I think about that's what our Heavenly Father desires. Our Heavenly Father desires for us to have this intimate relationship with him and out of that flow, um, the, uh, the obedience, the fruit of obedience. And so it's the story. Uh, it's a story of, in the life of Jesus. It's a couple of different Sabbaths, depending on uh, which gospel you read it out of. But I'm going to read it out of Matthew chapter 12 this morning. Uh, it's also found in Luke's gospel. And uh, it's, it's Jesus and his disciples and another one of these encounters with the Pharisees. And so I want to read the passage and then I'm going to focus just on one truth. There are a number of truths in this passage, but I'm going to focus on just one. So Matthew chapter 12, beginning in verse one, it says at that time, they went through the grain fields on the Sabbath and his disciples became hungry and began to pick the heads of grain and eat. But when the Pharisees saw this, they said to him, look, your disciples do what is not lawful on the Sabbath. But he said to them, have you not read that when Dave, what David did when he became hungry, he and his companions, how he entered the house of God. They ate the consecrated bread, which was not lawful for him to eat, nor for those who were with him, but for the priests alone. Or have you not read in the law that on the Sabbath, the priests in the temple break the Sabbath and are innocent? But I say to you that something greater than the temple is here. But if you had known what this means, I desire compassion and not sacrifice, you would have not condemned the innocent. For the Son of Man is the Lord of the Sabbath. Departing from there, he went into their synagogue, and a man was there whose hand was withered. And they questioned Jesus, asking, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? So that they might accuse him. And he said to them, what man is there among you who has a sheep? If it falls into a pit on the Sabbath, Will he not take hold of it and lift it out? How much more valuable then is a man than a sheep? So then is it lawful to do good on the Sabbath? And then he says to the man, stretch out your hand. He stretched it out and it was restored to normal like the other. But the Pharisees went out 
and conspired against him as to how they might destroy him. So when I read this passage of scripture, you know, the, the problem that, that's overbearing in this passage of scripture is, is that, you know, the Pharisees um, in these instances, they were frustrated because Jesus wasn't keeping, and I'm going to put in big quotes, their rules, their rules. They wanted Jesus to abide by their rules. They wanted to act the way that they expected him to act. And, and the reality is when we think about this, we, we got to go back and put into context, what is the Sabbath? Well, you can go back to Genesis chapter two, where God created the Sabbath. We all know the story. God worked six days in creation. And on the seventh day, he rested and he sanctified that day, he set it aside. And so the Sabbath was created in Genesis chapter two. But then we fast forward and we, we come to Exodus chapter 20, another very familiar passage, the Ten Commandments, and, and it was one of the ten. Jesus, our God said, you know, you should keep the Sabbath. It's a holy day. Set that day aside. Don't do any work. You or your wife or your servant, male servant or your female servant, you're not to do any work on that day. That day is holy. God set the pattern for us in, in creation that we work six days and we rest the seventh. And so the question that we ask is, was the Sabbath created for God's benefit? Or for man's benefit? Was the Sabbath created for God's benefit or man's benefit? And I, I believe that God modeled and created the Sabbath for us. It was a model for us. It wasn't a day for that, that was to be something that he needed. It was a day that we need. It was a pattern for life. If you work six and rest on the seventh, you need that for health. It, he later goes on and says it's a pattern for all of creation. Plant the fields six years and let them rest on the seventh. And we violate that today. We plant every year and we pump chemicals into them, trying to make it perform seven years in a row. But the problem had become not just the law and the intent of the law that God had, but that the rabbis down through time, uh, through, through their interpretation and their uh, qualifications of the Sabbath, they've added all these things to it. In fact, there's over 40 things added to uh, in the Mishnah and the, all of the things that the rabbis wrote, these are all the thou shalt nots, if you will, on the Sabbath. And it included things like you can't walk more than 2,000 cubits. You're not supposed to uh, harvest. You're not supposed to thresh. You're not supposed to sow. You're not supposed to uh, hunt. You're not supposed to dress an animal that you've, you've killed. You're not supposed to start a fire. And there's all these little things that man-made out of God's law. And, uh, and so those are all the specific thou shalt nots. And here's Jesus in this story. He and the disciples are walking along the road. The disciples are hungry and they reach out and they grab the head of the, of the stalk and they, they pull off of there the grains. And then in Luke's gospel, it defines that they take it and they roll it in their hands, separating the shaft from the, the grains of wheat, probably blow it, the shaft away and they begin to eat. And the Pharisees are concerned. I mean, they've probably walked more than 2,000 cubits. They've, here they are uh, reaping on the uh, Sabbath. And now they're, not only are they reaping, they're, they're threshing, they're, they're separating the grain and, and they're eating. And, um, and then in the next instance, uh, Jesus is going to heal uh, on the Sabbath. And is it right to do that? that? That would be considered work. And so they're more concerned about the rules than they are about the relationship. They're more concerned about Jesus following the pattern that they believe he should follow than, than this relationship. And Jesus says, listen, I'm the Lord of the Sabbath. I created it and I created it for you. It's not, not to be created for rules. And I love Jesus' answer. Um, you know, every time, if you just go through the scripture, this is an interesting study. Every time Jesus is asked a question, he answers with a question. And so he says to them, do you not know? Have you not read? Do you not remember that when David was hungry, he went into the house of God? That's no, no, number one. And then he ate the consecrated bread, the bread that was intended for the priests only. No, no, number two. And yet he was innocent. The, the priests work every Sabbath. They, they fulfill the, the things uh, uh, of their duties in the tabernacle, and yet they are innocent. And so what he's saying to them is, listen, I love verse seven. It says, but if you had known what this means, I desire compassion and not sacrifice. And this was the section where it's like, okay, God, this is where the lesson comes out. Jesus said, listen, I desire compassion and not sacrifice. I said, well, I want to go back and see that. So you turn back to Hosea chapter six, verse six, and that's where that, path, that verse comes from that Jesus is quoting. And here's what it says. I delight in loyalty rather than sacrifice and in the knowledge of God rather than than burnt offerings. So what Jesus is, is saying here, he's quoting the father and the father says through the, 
prophet Hosea, what I desire is I desire loyalty. I desire faithfulness. I desire this relationship more than I desire the sacrifice. And I desire the knowledge of God. And so I wanted to see what that meant. What was the knowledge of God? And in the Hebrew, it, that knowledge is to know, not just to know headwise, but to know intimately. It literally means companionship, cohabitation, and intimacy. When you go to the root word of that knowledge of God, what God is saying is, I want you to know me. I want you to have intimacy with me. I want, I want you to cohabit with me. As we would say in our language, I want you to abide with me more than I want the sacrifice, more than I want obedience, more than I want the burnt offering. I want intimacy. God delights, God desires in faithfulness, in intimacy, not in sacrifice, not in offerings, not in sheer obedience, not in rules. God desires relationship over rules. I will tell you, this is, a, this is something great to remember. Rules without relationship always leads to rebellion. Rules without relationship always leads to rebellion. And so when I think about what is Jesus saying here, he's saying, listen, guys, get off the rules. Look what's standing in front of you. Have a relationship with a God who created the Sabbath. Have a relationship with a God who, who made the Sabbath for you, but don't be bound up in the rules. I want the relationship. So I want to give you four things that God wants. He wants relationship over rules. He wants friendship over formulas. He wants presence over performance. And he wants compassion over passion. The, the Pharisees were zealous. They were passionate about the rules. And Jesus said, listen, if you'd have known what it means, I desire compassion, not sacrifice. It's not about denying yourself all these things. It's about having a relationship with me. This is the word that the Lord gave me. You can separate obedience from intimacy. You can be obedient without having a relationship, at least for a season. I don't think you can do it long term, but you can do it for a season. But you cannot separate intimacy from obedience. You can separate obedience from intimacy, but you cannot separate intimacy from obedience. And when I thought about that, I thought about what Jesus said in John chapter 14. Jesus said, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. You don't keep my commandments to show that you love me. Jesus said, if you love me, the natural outpouring of that, we know that. What's the natural outpouring of abiding in Christ? Much fruit. John chapter 15, verse 5. And so what, what, what Jesus is trying to say here, guys, quit, being cons quit worrying about whether I'm going to heal this guy's hand or not on the Sabbath. Have compassion on him. I'm about to change a life here. You, you pull your sheep up out of the pit. I want to change this man's life. His hand has been withered. He can't work. Have compassion over the rules. So you can separate obedience from intimacy, but you cannot separate intimacy from obedience. And when you think about that, what's the greatest commandment? Jesus said, they can boil them down to two. The first is the most important, love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and then love others. It's simple as that. Love God and love others, but you can't love others unless you love God. You, you got to have the intimate abiding relationship with Christ, with the Holy Spirit. What does God desire the most from you? He desires intimacy. He desires an abiding relationship. And in order to do that, we have to be a God seeker. We have to be a God abider. And then the fruit comes. The fruit from within, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Those things happen within. And when they're happening within, they can't help but to spill out. But it all begins because we have the love of the Father in us, because we have the love of the Father with us, because we have this intimate relationship with him. So I want to challenge you as you go throughout this day and your weekend and next week. I want you to think about the fact that what God desires the most from you is an intimate relationship. He desires intimacy, and out of that intimacy will come obedience. I think about Mary and Martha, that famous contrasting moment in the life of Jesus, and we all know what Jesus said. He said, you know, Mary's found it. Martha, you're so busy trying to be obedient, trying to serve, that you've missed the most important thing, that time with me, that intimacy with me. And then I think about Peter, and I think about the fact that when Peter failed Jesus, he'd been walking with him for three years, companion, always there. He's one of the three. And in this moment when there's a failure, when Jesus comes back to him, doesn't, 
I think it's amazing Jesus doesn't say, Peter, now next time, here's how I want you to act. Next time, you need to be better. What is Jesus asking? He asked him, Peter, do you love me? Then feed my sheep. Do you love me? Then take care of my lambs. Do you love me? And Peter said, Lord, you know I love you. And he said, I know you love me. So now go do the work. What he was saying is the relationship, the intimacy is the most important thing. And so I just challenge you guys this week as you go and this weekend and, and throughout next week. Remember, what God desires most from you is an intimate relationship, an abiding relationship that will produce fruit in your life, the fruit of obedience. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your amazing word. And I thank you for um, paradigm shifting thoughts that you give us um, as we as we live our lives. And Lord, I know I confess and uh, as I went through the journey the first time and come to the realization that what you desire most from me is not for me to be faithful and obedient and and working. What you desire is for me to be with you. You desire presence over the performance. You desire my friendship. You desire my relationship. And I thank you for that, that you would be a God who would come down to, to create a path where I could be uh, redeemed, restored, and reconciled to you in a relationship where we can commune together throughout the day and we can walk together from day to day and I can lean on you and, and you can encourage me and you can direct me and you can lead me and you can use me but you can't use me unless we're walking together. And so I just pray God for these men that are on here today. And we all have distractions. We all are busy. Uh, we have families and, and with the things that have gone on in our world, those, those routines are upside down and have been interrupted and businesses are, are flourishing in one area and other areas are struggling. And every day is just a battle Lord to, to maintain. And I just pray father for, for the grace for these men to walk in intimacy with you first and foremost. Father, for them to have that abiding relationship, to seek you every day. And Father, find that connection with you throughout the day, not just for a few minutes in the morning, but throughout the day as they walk, as, as, as they're proceeding through the pathway of life and the steps that you've ordained for them. And I pray, Father, that in, in, uh, in this weekend, as they, as they go to worship, as they, as they have a, a day of rest, I pray, Father, that they would find you in the midst of all of that and, and just have this connection with you to love you and to have a relationship with you that leads them to a, an abundance of fruit. Father, not only for uh, your kingdom and, and those around them, but for themselves personally, Father. I thank you for this moment. I thank you for your word. I ask you to bless these men, cause your face to shine upon them today, give them favor in all that they do. And we are careful, Father, to give you all the praise and the glory. In Jesus' name, amen.